elitists. That even preceded community college movement. Uh, but they felt that low-income students who were able to get into higher education needed some kind of financial assistance. And so they set about making that happen. Uh, they had a vision of having an organization in every state that would help students access financial assistance to go to college. So that's been our historic mission. Over the years, um, the access to higher education has, has stayed with us. Uh, we sort of morphed into helping those young people uh, get successful at higher education. But our mission became very focused uh, three, three and a half years ago with our new CEO, Bill Hansen. And he came in and he said, you know, access is still very important and success in completion of higher education is very important. But what really matters is what happens to students as a result of their higher education experience. Because we were looking at some data that we had and um, we all know the, the completion data, so I'm not going to dwell on that, but we know not enough students finish. We know that low, low income completion rates are, are really alarmingly low, particularly for low income students of color. We all know that. But what was a bit more um, surprising, at least to some of us, was that even those who managed to finish college, um, and about 60% do, that about half of them find themselves unemployed, underemployed, or wish they could change their major if they had to do it all over again. So our mission came um, about uh, a focus that we call completion with a purpose. And that is connecting higher education <coughs> to workforce and economic development so that those who start higher education finish, yes, but finish able to launch a successful career. Because a successful career is the basis for a fulfilling, successful life. So our philanthropy, our business solutions that we have, our products and business solutions that we have um, in our company, in our philanthropy, is all focused around completion with a purpose, the connection between education and the workforce. So we're here today to talk about um, how we measure that. We're here today to talk about maybe a new way of looking at how we evaluate quality and value of a higher education um, is a provider. We know that federal policy has been leaning towards this with employment outcomes, with the national scorecard. So this is you know, becoming national discussion. It's becoming part of the policy environment, both in Washington, D.C. and in the states. Uh, but it could be a new way of thinking about how do we evaluate value of college and quality of college. You know, for, for most of the time in higher education, we evaluate the quality of higher education by a lot of what I would call inputs. Uh, the quality of the campuses, the number of buildings, the number of tenured faculty, um, and the way that um, those are gathered is, is, is the institution and the people in them, work in them, they, they develop those measurements and those inputs. The consumer voice, the consumer perspective, what actually happens to consumers as a result of participation in these providers' experience, that has been missing, really, from the discussion. And so USA funds, um, our body of work is about empowering the consumer and giving the consumer voice in the evaluation of the quality and value of higher education. Uh, yesterday, we had an announcement here at the conference about our collaboration with Gallup. And we are going to be embarking with Gallup on creating the largest database ever about consumer perspectives of higher education. Current students, former students, um, aspiring students. Uh, we are creating with Gallup a daily poll that will talk to 500 people a day over about 122,000 over a year. Customers, consumers of higher education, getting their experiences and their perspectives. And we believe this will provide actionable insights uh, for those of you in this room, the entrepreneurs, 
for high education providers, for state policy leaders, as a different way of looking at value and quality from the consumer perspective. So with that, um, I hope, framework, I want to talk about a body of work that we've uh, engaged in over a year now. And some of the tools that our folks are going to be creating are going to come to fruition this summer. So you're getting a sneak preview at what our college value uh, products and tools are going to look like available to consumers, uh, individual consumers, state policy leaders, and higher education leaders. And that body of work is all of these folks are involved in creating new tools and new discussions in states around this notion of consumer perspective on college value. So let's start, um, let's start with, um, let's start with you, Mark Schneider. College measures. So what are you measuring? Why do you measure it? And what are you hoping to achieve with all of this? Thank you. Uh, so college measure been around for about six years and we've worked uh, with seven states uh, and the, all these states have linked their unemployment insurance wage data with student level data. Um, and basically when I left NCS, I was the commissioner of NCS um, and I spent an incredible amount of time just worrying about higher education data systems and how bad they were and in fact how they weren't adequately measuring outcomes. Uh, when I left, we, we knew that many states had linked their student level data with wage data. There may be 30 states at the time that said that they had done it one way or the other. Um, and I said, well, if it's all sitting in the bottom of a desk drawer or someplace, why isn't it made public? Um, so I went, I had a really good Rolodex. One of the nice things about being a high level government official is you walk out of the with not very much money, but you walk out with a nice Rolodex. And um, I just started writing people. I said, look, you know, I have some money from uh, Lumina Foundation, actually. Will you give me your data? And a bunch of states said, sure, we would. And, um, and over time, we've been evolving uh, the methods and the degree to which we measure at the program level. So the unit that we report on is the program level because there's more variation between programs than there is between institutions. And the patterns of the return on investment, wages and outcomes vary systematically depending on what area of study someone takes. Well, what, what is return on investment, first okay. of all? So the return on investment, um, so I think of the college application, college going, and ultimately the ROI question, the return on the invest, investment, being driven by six questions. The first one is will I get into a place and actually into a college and actually, except for very elite schools, in fact, most schools are pretty much open admissions. So we are very fixated on elite schools, but the fact of the matter is there are many pathways into the middle class that don't go through Harvard or Yale. So will I get in? Will I get out? And this goes back to the issue of the, gradu of the huge variation in, in graduation rates. How long will it take? So there's huge variation in how long it takes to get a degree. And that, and that starts costing students money in terms of paying tuition, fees, et cetera, and also opportunity costs. So the states that we work with, Texas is uh, the prime example of reporting the time to degree at the program level. How much will it cost? So those are the kinds of things that students have to figure when they're trying to figure out what their investment of time, energy, and money <coughs> is. Ultimately, what's the return? The return is twofold. First one is monetary. So again, all the states we're working with have been reporting wages one, five, and 10 years after completion, and we're able to track the trajectories of earnings by program, program by program by program, um, in the states, and, the, and the, the new partnership that we have is with Gallup, so it's not only how much will I make, but how good a life will I have. And those non-monetary components are actually very important because the fact of the matter is people are choosing professions that we are telling them and that they probably in their heart of hearts know do not have high return on investments, 
but are things that they want to do, but they may in fact have a, a wonderful life and an, an engaging career, but they just may not be making a lot of money. But our goal is to inform students about the monetary payoffs in terms of the ROI and the non-monetary payoff in terms of an engaged work uh, career and a good life. So how do people get this information? So we are working with uh, states like Texas, uh, Colorado, Tennessee, Minnesota are our first four partner states. We are, we are building a state app that will come out uh, in Colorado on June the 8th or 9th. The, the exact day is still in, 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 uh, in process. Um, and then again on, um, in Colorado, um, I'm sorry, in Tennessee, the end of June. Uh, these will be, so these are state sites that uh, they deal with the ROI of programs, they identify, they help students identify hot jobs, what are the jobs that are most in demand as identified by the states, hot skills, what are the kinds of skills that put you in competition for those jobs, what is it like, what is the job market in your, in your region, not only, so some jobs are state competitive and other jobs are local, so we have, uh, you could drill down on the region level, uh, so there, there are going to be state sites accompanied with an, out, uh, an outreach campaign. We're working with different kinds of uh, college access networks uh, to put this in the hand of as many people as possible. And ultimately, we hope to partner with uh, some community colleges and regional campuses. The, we know that the flagships have no interest in this at all, uh, but the regional campuses and the community colleges are, are, are going to be partners in, in moving forward on this, on this project. How is this different from the federal government's college navigator? Sounds like the same thing to me. Absolutely, totally different. And the reason is that the federal government is right now only has data at the institution level. And the institutional comparisons are not useful compared to the program comparisons. So give me an example. I'm a student and I, I watch a lot of television and I love the, the chef shows. Right. So I'm going to want to go into culinary. What will I know about that as you a result know, of your work? You will know which programs um, exist, right? You will know how much they cost. You will know what their completion rates are. You will know, uh, you will know how long it takes to complete, and you'll know that you're probably never going to make your money back. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like a good thing to know, I suppose. Um, so, Brandon, you've teamed up with this, and. It, I call, them, I call them the odd couple, you know. Um, you got the, the finance gains guy, and then you've got the warm and fuzzy Gallup, how's your life going, right? Oh, thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> so Gallup has teamed up um, with uh, College Measures, but you, uh, Gallup has been involved. Well, maybe say a little bit about your work in higher education, and we've teamed up on a couple of things, but uh, yeah. sort of how you got involved in all those college values. Well, look, I mean, let's just go back to the, the, to the backdrop right now, right? This is, this is all going to sound like crazy talk when I say it, but we, and by the way, as I say this, it's not to say that the people who are doing these things aren't doing good work, right? But you just take the, the what we're using now to measure what are the best colleges and universities in the country. To Carol's point earlier, it's largely based on input measures, not outputs or outcomes. We really don't have a single measurement on outcomes, right, uh, in terms of ratings and rankings. Uh, here's a good example. No one has ever measured the learning growth and development of students from when they matriculate to when they graduate. Now, if you think that might be a good measure of who the best institutions are, right, it just doesn't exist. And so I think that our whole conversation at this conference is, you, you've all heard the expression, we are, we are what we measure. Here's the list of what we systematically measure in education. And it's just not any more complicated than this. It's test scores, it's grades, and it's graduation rates. Now, I'm not saying that any of those are unimportant. They're all critical. But in and of themselves, they're horribly insufficient because they miss so much of the story. So let me just give you a couple other crazy points. The average letter grade in college right now is an A. GPA in higher education has gone up 1.1 points in the last 30 years. So those of you who graduated 30 years ago with a 
I have good news for you. That's a 4.0. <laughs> it sounds silly as I say it, right? But here's the reality. The implications of this are that the world's most admired employer, Google, no longer asks candidates for grades and test scores because they found no correlation between those and success on the job at Google, and that's any job at Google. Blue collar, white collar, all the jobs at Google. Now, this is not a story that this is the end of tests and grades and graduation rates, right? But if that's all we're measuring, we miss a big part of the picture. So Mark's work, right, in looking at earnings, there are English majors from an institution in Texas that make a lot more money than other English majors at a different institution in Texas. How is that possible? Same state, same major, right? And there are noticeable differences. So already you start to see program level differences on earnings. When Gallup measures things like, what do we measure? We're measuring um, the degree to which people are engaged in their work. We're measuring the degree to which they're thriving in their overall well-being. And of course, as I say those things, half of you are going, well, how do you measure that? Right? And then if, and, if, and if I can convince you that you can reliably measure that, which by the way you can, the, the rest of you are saying, well, does it really matter? Well, let me just give you an example. An engaged employee, the way we measure it, is more productive. They're less likely to be sick or absent. They stay longer in the organization. They have fewer safety incidents. They're less likely to steal. And if it's a for-profit company, they produce more revenue and profit. Does that all sound pretty good? Yeah. So engagement is a pretty important measure, not just a soft, fluffy measure. This is in well-being the way we measure it. An employee who's thriving in all five elements of well-being has one-third the health care cost burden compared to somebody who isn't. So these are not nice to have. These are pretty necessary measures. I wouldn't just measure those things because, of course, earnings and all kinds of other things are important ways to round out the perspective. Um, so you know, what we've learned in this through a uh, study of college graduates, and, and when we went and did this uh, in partnership with Purdue University, I mean, I always say this, it's the largest representative study of college graduates in US history. That sounds like a really awesome thing to, it's the only large scale representative study of college graduates in US history. Just pause on that for a minute. Several hundred years of higher education and two years ago was the first time anyone went out and did a large scale representative study of college graduates asking, how you doing? <laughs> That's what we did. And what'd you think? I mean, it's a little more sophisticated than that, but that's essentially <laughs> what we did. And so uh, the voice of the consumer, right, if we want to use the word consumer, most higher education is a very powerful one because I'll give you an idea. Right now in today's scorecard, the Ivy League beats, I'm going to use this as an example, historically black colleges and universities on all the traditional metrics we look at today. Okay, so if you want to look at graduation rates, if you want to look at loan default rates, you want to look at all those current measures that we use. So today's scorecard, you compare Ivy League as a group of institutions to HBCUs, Ivy League wins on every measure. What we found in our study though is graduates who strongly agreed to having certain experiences during college doubles their odds that they're engaged in their work over their lifetime. Here's some examples of these things. You strongly agreed that the professors at your alma mater cared about you as a person. You strongly agreed that you had a mentor who encouraged your goals and dreams. You strongly agreed that you had a job or internship, not just a job or internship, but one where you applied what you were learning in the classroom. These are really important statements. Ask yourselves these questions, right? If you strongly agreed to them, I guarantee you they had a pretty major role in the shaping of your career and your success. Here's the point. We identified six key elements of the college experience that double your odds of being engaged in work later. Now if I measure graduates from Ivy League institutions compared to graduates from historically black colleges and universities, get what we, guess, here's the report card. HBCUs beat the Ivy League on four of the six measures. They tie on one and they trail on only a single measure. Let me just give you this percentage. 17% of Ivy League graduates strongly agree their professors cared about them as a person. At HBCU institutions, it's 56% who strongly agree. Now when I say that, all of a sudden everybody's shocked and then a second later you go, no actually, that kind of makes sense. <laughs> because you think about what we're aiming at, right? And, I, and I, look, Ivy League institutions are doing a fabulous job, so this is not me picking, I'm just saying if you start to introduce a new measure, a voice of the graduates, right? These are the graduates from these institutions themselves. The difference in the feelings that you had professors who cared about you as a person is a 3x differential in favor of HBCU institutions. So, 
In any event, the point is, if we start to measure these things, we start to learn different things. These data don't change those data, right? But they certainly change the conversation about the value that's being provided by these institutions. So how are you two teaming up to create, in these states, this robust picture? So are you doing it by program, by institution, as Mark is? Or which, what is your role with this whole? Yeah, so very quickly, I mean, we, so we're conducting this large representative study, and it's large enough that we can get down to cohorts of institutions, right? Our sampling is not large enough where we can measure an individual institution. Where we can do it, though, is where institutions will uh, work with Gallup to measure their own alumni, right, to do a comprehensive audit of their alumni and these outcomes. What a novel idea, right? We do financial audits every year. Why wouldn't we be auditing how our graduates are doing on all these different things that we're trying to measure, right? And, and so if, if, if we can have access to working with an institution where we can measure their alumni, we can absolutely take all these measures down to a, a program level where we, when we've done it, we've seen just like Mark has, big, the big story here is variance across programs, right? Large institutions where we've measured this, there's a report card for the institution, but if you look across their nine colleges, there is very big differentials on how they're doing on some of these measures that we have. So as, as it evolves, right. it's possible that all these measures could be brought down, not just to an institutional level, but a program level. Right, so right, I'm sorry. So right now what we're doing is uh, we're taking, we're aggregating some uh, disciplines into, so it's not political science and sociology reported separately, like what, what we could do with the wage outcomes, but we will report the outcomes at, say for example, at the social science level. Humanities. Or humanities, business mm -hmm. at that level. Which, you know, think about it for a minute, of, that's kind of interesting for consumers to look at. Um, you've got the traditional rankings that you could look at in major magazine, um, or you, you could look at this consumer information, or both, to get a, a complete uh, picture. Sarah, you know about this. Indiana, and I'm not saying that just because it's our home state, but has been a leader in this return on investment uh, conversation. Uh, I think it's been, what, two or three years now mm -hmm. uh, that the state of Indiana has put out a report on what graduates by program, <coughs> by public institution in Indiana make one year, five years, and ten years out by program. And this was not without controversy, so it was a brave thing for the Commission for Higher Education to do in Indiana. More states should do it. But tell me a little bit about Indiana's interest and the, the college value index your state is creating with these two gentlemen here. Sure. So we, uh, in 2013, we put out our first OR, ROI report. Um, but leading up to that, I think we, frankly, we just read one too many articles that said, is college worth it, um, followed by an anecdote of the, the, you know, barista with six figures of debt and a college degree. And a um, good friend of mine always says the plural of anecdote is not data. Um, so we decided to combat some of those anecdotes with data of our own and to um, tackle the question of, is college worth it, with data. Um, novel idea. So um, we've done um, a series of return on investment reports. The very first was a state level look, um, really just saying, you know, does college pay? And what we found from the state level look was that um, for college graduates, if you look four years after graduation, on average they have earned more than two dollars back for every dollar they invested in their higher education. Um, so we looked at that and then as Carol mentioned, we then followed up with a series that looked at program level, um, salary one, five and 10 years out, but also looking at the top three industries of employment, um, which is also interesting to see that, you know, some fields like nursing, um, you know, education, what you major in has a very clean tie to the industry you're gonna work in. You know, education majors become teachers, nursing majors become nurses. Um, for many others, you know, the, the top category of a, a liberal arts degree, for example, might only have 3% of graduates in that industry. Um, so it, it shows that you know, some, some programs have very clear paths, others have lots of different paths, which just really means that the students, um, to maximize their return, really need to be proactive and, and creative in how they are going to convert that degree into a, a career, and in particular that first job. Um, we've just recently released a third um, release of the same data, but in a more interactive fashion. So um, we can go online and pull, you know, compare different colleges, different programs. It makes it very clear what others have said that um, it's not where you study, but what you study that matters the most in terms of return on investment in, in dollars and cents. 
Um, so all that has been done. Um, but we know that we're, we're subject to the critique, and we've known all along, that this, you know, higher education is not a financial instrument. Um, you're not putting a dollar in and then sitting and waiting for it to earn money for you. you know, it's, a, it's a mechanism for finding a fulfilling life and a fulfilling career. Um, so looking at that, you know, we've had the opportunity with USA Funds um, and Gallup to um, be able to fold in the qualitative data that Brandon mentioned in terms of do I have a fulfilling career, do I have a fulfilling life, um, and round that out. So taking the dollars and cents, supplementing it with some of the lifestyle improvements that come from a college degree, um, and we're forming that all together in a college value index. Um, we'll be publishing this um, right around the start of the next academic year for um, most of our public institutions at a campus level. Um, and what the College Value Index does is, it, at a very high level, it, said, it asks three questions. Am I going to graduate from this institution? Am I going to learn something? Um, am I going to learn what I need? And am I going to get a fulfilling job out of it? Um, we slice each of those three ways. So we look at what do the numbers say? We look at what do the graduates say, coming from the, the Gallup data, and then we look at what does the college do um, to actually get something out of those results. So not just getting the best people in, but what supports are they providing? Are they helping students find jobs? Um, are they helping students find internships? Things like that. Um, and then at the bottom line of the value index are really the two key questions that get to value. If something's valuable, it's worth the cost. So was your higher education worth the cost? Um, is the first, and the second is just were you satisfied with the result you got? Um, you know, so we think that those three questions slice those three ways with those bottom line. Um, that is probably what any family, any student should be thinking about as they're looking at their higher education choices. It's really interesting. Um, you said a couple of things. One, that you found through your data that it's less important where you go than what you study. Did I hear you say that? Correct. Um, and then this information will somehow be made available to the students. <coughs> Tell me a little bit about what the response of the higher education institutions in Indiana, what, what the re response has been, and um, have there been positive, I guess, results of this? Have you th seen things change in higher ed yet? Um, I, the institutions, I think, um, initially, anytime we put out a report, I think it, there's a natural wariness of, you're, how are you using our data? Are we, are we using data to beat you over the head with a stick or to embarrass you or to uh, um, you know, do winners and losers? And, and I think when we, once we published the first version and showed that it was um, very fair, very neutral, and, and just really helpful information, then our, our institutions have been supportive of the effort. Um, and I think that's really indicated also with the, the level of participation we have in the College Value Index and the work with Gallup and the willingness to um, you know, to, to ask these tough questions that haven't been asked before and to make that available to consumers. So I, um, I've been really happy with the response. I think um, perhaps the, the biggest consumer so far has been, um, you know, our um, General Assembly and some of the other um, lawmakers and stakeholders in the state that are um, really looking at this and, um, and using it to, um, in part, justify a, a continued investment in higher education, you know, and, um, and you know, looking and saying, yes, it, it is worth it if you look at the data. So I think that's been a, a key stakeholder that sort of took the data and, and have used it uh, quickly. Um, and I think we're looking at, with the value index in particular, how do we integrate that data, those information, where the decisions are happening? So it's, you know, it's not enough to tell a college student who's three years down the road, oh, here's something interesting, you're going to make $30,000. The idea is that um, we have more integrated um, sort of structural career exploration while people are in high school, while they're making, you know, while they're even thinking about what they're taking their sophomore, junior in high school, building toward the career that they want. Um, and that we get those data integrated into those structures for a traditional pipeline. Even more challenging is with the returning adult population. Um, but we think that we have a pretty good mechanism. Um, we've built an infrastructure for returning adults in Indiana to help them through a college match process um, and hook them up with ambassadors at institutions. But through that work, um, we're looking for opportunities to also take the college value data and the return on investment data um, and make that available to those adults at that point in time when they're deciding, um, if they're deciding to go back to higher education, um, what are they going to pursue and where are they going to go? That's a really good angle, the adult returning student. Who knows where they get their information today, right? It's really hard mm -hmm. for them to access good quality information. 
And I think for the adults who've been out for a while, the you know they know the difference between a good salary and a bad salary, and what that can mean for your family and, and your well-being. So that's interesting. That this could be particularly helpful for those 36 million adults in the U.S. with some college but no degree. We know from the da the data from the Gallup, those are probably the least fulfilled in career-wise mm -hmm. than any other group that we studied. Right? We learned yep. that yesterday from your. Yeah, there are, I mean, a lot of these things we've been measuring, they're, they're on par with people uh, who didn't finish high school. Yeah. So it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's not a great outcome, right? But they're, you know, it's interesting too, they're not, you know, the, the typical view we have of dropouts, right? You know, you look at institutions now that are accepting adult learners, uh, and on average, uh, they're bringing five different transcripts with them. You know, these are not quitters. <laughs> and I'm sure there's some percentage in there that that's, Right? But these are people who were disrupted, right? Uh, a lot of them are high percentage are military, right? So they've been moving around from location to location, picking up bits and pieces of this and never finishing, right? So, you know, we, we also have to understand, too, that this is not a group of people who just kind of gave up on their education. I mean, life interfered in a number of ways. Uh, and if we can't figure out how we fit educational opportunities around what is, you know, becoming more and more common for most of us, right? Life, jobs, earnings, all those other kinds of things. Uh, that's another challenge that we've, we've been talking a lot about at this conference as well. And getting them good information would be really helpful. So Jason, you represent, I'm sure you'll tell us, the U.S. Chamber represents how many employers across the country. What's, your, what's the employer interest here? Why, why have we engaged you with the, these folks here? Yeah, thank you, Carol. Yeah, just to give you a little background about who we are as an organization, the, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is uh, the world's largest private sector association. We represent a federation of state and local chambers that's over 2,500 strong. We have representation in every state in the union. And uh, collectively, our membership is over 3 million businesses, the, the vast majority of which are small to mid-sized enterprises who are the vast majority of job creators in this country. Uh, so we are a member-driven organization, and uh, the U.S. Chamber and its foundation are really responsive to its members' interests. And what has been top on their minds over these past few years is the issue of workforce development and the skills gap. So when we talk about value, when we talk about re return on investment, I'm hoping my contribution to this panel is to really kind of flip that script around a little bit and say, well, there's another consumer out there, uh, and that's the employer community. And if you were to survey the employer community today, you'd find over 90% of CEOs believe that there is a critical skills gap facing their industry in this country. Half of them have unfilled vacancies that are staying open for longer periods of time. And nearly 40% of them cannot take on new business that's available to them today. And the chief reason is they do not have the human capital to take that business on. So this is not some gathering storm on the horizon anymore. This is something that employers are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's crippling their ability to grow and compete in today's economy. And you can see some of the results of that being the, the sluggish growth that we've had um, in our country. So employers do not see this as, you know, we're just trying to fill jobs, fill seats, uh, but they see talent as a key driver of their competitive advantage. Now, where they rely on getting that source of talent is largely the post-secondary system. And if I could borrow one of the, the Gallup stats that were released that we like to cite, if you were to ask employers, are you satisfied with the career readiness of recent graduates, only about 11% of them believe um, that, that those students are in fact career ready. Uh, only about a third of students uh, perceive themselves as being ready. And what's more interesting is employers are increasingly looking to newly credentialed individuals to fill that talent pipeline need, particularly in a firm labor market. And you have now over 65% of employers saying that they need to hire these newly credentialed individuals if they are going to actually have the workforce that they need to compete and grow in today's society. So there, there's more than one consumer out there. It's not just the student who's trying to make good decisions about their family and their life and to make sure that they have good well-being down the road. Uh, but we have a nation that needs to thrive in a global economy, and they need talent to do that. So we've embarked on a, a kind of a program of work in partnership with USA Funds, and thank you for that, Carol, to really try to elevate the employer voice, to strengthen the employer leadership position in these systems so they're no longer merely advisors or beneficiaries of post-secondary systems, but really end customers of talent supply chains, and for them to really take a more proactive role in communicating what they need, how many they need, and what the requirements are for being a preferred supplier of talent to that company or that industry. So right now, using a, a supply chain approach, we are trying to really think through what employers need to really build their capacity, particularly chambers of commerce and economic development groups who could really organize and communicate on behalf of their member companies uh, with these institutions, but to look at new ways that they could begin sharing data. 
Uh, so I mentioned, you know, forecasting their level of need to make sure that they could accurately communicate to those higher ed providers, this is how many individuals we need in our pipeline on any given year given these market conditions. That they can let them know what the talent specs are. Here are the competency and credentialing requirements needed in order to fill those positions. For them to communicate the new performance metrics that matter most to employers to secure that partnership. Not just inputs and outputs, but looking at measures that cut across institutional partners and extend into employment. Measures like time to fill, time to full productivity in the workforce, time to career advancement, but to make sure that employers have the metrics that speak to their business value that really buttresses why they're partnering with those institutions. And we're also looking how employers could better integrate their own data to back map where they source their talent from. So an employer can look and say, well, where, where are our current sources of talent? How well are they performing? Where do we get our best talent from? And who are underutilized providers that we might be able to tap into uh, to reinforce other initiatives that we have, such as diversity goals or objectives. So we're looking at a wide variety of ways that employers could play this new leadership role. And one of the more exciting ways that we'd like to continue to explore later this year is how to build a first ever employer-led quality assurance system. So much like we have kind of the, the accreditation system that the federal government uses to administer Title IV grants and loans, looking at how employers could put their incentives on the line and better communicate what are the process and performance requirements to be a recognized provider of talent to our industry or company, and how we can do that not on a company by company basis, but really do that in a scalable way across the nation so companies can plug in and communicate better to the field, here are our preferred providers of talent. And we think then these career guidance systems can also not only tell you what you're going to make and how well you're going to do and if you're going to complete, but they can tell you where those graduates go to work and what kind of success they've achieved. So if I know I want to be an engineer at Boeing, I know the four university programs that they source the majority of engineers from. I know the pathway to get there. I'm not just taking my chances in a spot market. And just the last thing I'll say, Carol, is one of the, the, the most powerful things I've noticed in this approach, because it, it comes across as, well, this is about employers just getting what they want, they're being selfish. This is a shared value approach. Supply chains create shared value and shared competitiveness. And one of the best points of value that they could bring to the table is often the thing a student is missing most when they're transitioning to employment is a network. Particularly low-income students, uh, students who are the first ones to enter into a college environment and their family, they do not have the social networks to really navigate that transition successfully. So we can give them all the competence they want, all the credentials that they want, but it's them and 100 people like them fighting for those jobs in these positions. And we think if institutions become more savvy at being part of a talent supply chain for for companies, that they'd be able to not only give students all of those good things in terms of skills and credentials, but they could give them powerful networks to manage that successful transition into a career. Well, we've got about nine minutes left, and I want to um, open it up to folks and hear what's on your minds, because we could go on and on up here. We're all passionate, as you could see, about this new arena of ways to evaluate quality from the consumer perspective. and employers as, as consumers. But um, I'd like to make it a little more interactive and open it up for some comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for being here. This is great. Uh, my name is Chris Conley from Better Week Days. Uh, what could we in the, in the ed tech community do to help you? That's a good question. I think a lot, but I'm going to let uh, oh, these so guys I, 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 So for us, the, the, the biggest question is actually, we could develop these tools. How do you get them out? Right, what, how do you build the connections? So most of us are not you know, consumer experts who are sort of groping around. Uh, I mean, we, we sort of have this mixed idea. I mean, and, and like we build these things and the General Assembly, you know, the, the legislature uses it. Well, that's okay, uh, but it's not the end game, right? We're trying to, you know, to, to quote the President of the United States, our goal is to, to prevent students from doing stupid shit. Right. <laughs> so I could, I could use that because I'm quoting uh, the president. Uh, I was warned to watch what, what I <laughs> I did warn him, but he doesn't. Okay. Really. But I just quoted someone else, so that's okay. Oh, okay. 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 Uh, uh, you know, so, I mean, so we're trying to get the message out. You know, if you are going to get a job with the likely outcome, you're going to make $30,000, don't borrow $75,000, right? Don't do that. That's dumb. That's stupid, right? If you, so the other thing that we're trying to do is communicate what the skills are that are in demand. So this turns out to be a really difficult question. We're exploring all kinds of options about how to identify hot skills. Um, and you know, we're, we're, we're narrowing down to a couple of approaches. One of the approaches that we're trying to use is like detailed work activities. These are occupations and these are the things you do every day in this occupation. If you don't like those things, that's 
probably not a good job for you. But our, I mean, so we could do this. We're experts at this stuff. We have data. We know how to use data. But how how do we actually get this into the hands of 17-year-old, 18-year-old kids? How do we get them? The, the returning worker is like the, every state we work in all, I mean, not all, but they care passionately, uh, uh, passionately about this. How do we get to those people? We, we have a partnership now with CMT, and we're, trying to, um, and, and we're trying to figure out how to help them reach 90 million households uh, that, that listen to their, you know, w watch their TV or listen to their radio about, like, if you're going to upskill, this is the way to do it, right? These are the programs that matter. These are the kinds of careers that you could have. These are the occupations that work for you. But we are struggling on how to disseminate, uh, disseminate that information. Brandon, do you have any thoughts about that? You know, I'll just say, look, uh, ed tech entrepreneurs, whether you know it or not, hopefully you un uh, appreciate this, uh, you're driving a lot of the thought leadership and conversation and education. And so you have a couple choices. One, you can pitch your products and services as things that move the needle on all the traditional outcomes, test scores, grades, and graduation rates. Or you can start to pitch them around moving the needle on other kinds of measures. And there are examples of organizations that are doing this, right? But, you know, uh, why would we think students are career ready? This is a good example. If we're not measuring anything that correlates with career readiness, right, or career outcomes, like actual real career success, right? And so, I mean, you know, the, I think you have a role in thinking about how you can pitch what success is for you and your product and your service and your company through the lens of not just always talking about how students who you know, use this math application, their GPA went up 0.2 points. Okay, now that's not a bad outcome. Don't get me wrong, right? I would cite that. I'd run with that. That'd be part of my marketing. But I think we can also think about aiming at other measures of success because part of this is teaching students and parents that there are other ways to become successful in the world other than how your child scores on an exam, right? And so I worry that we're devastating a lot of people because we're measuring them on a very narrow set of indicators. And just think about it, okay, all the entrepreneurs in this room, we do a better job in this country, in our school system, identifying kids with entrepreneurial talent. This is what we do. We're more likely to put them on ADHD meds than we are to recognize <laughs> that as a talent and develop it. Okay, and anybody who's an entrepreneur in this room knows it because you know you're probably weren't a 4.0 student. You might have done really well in a couple classes. You got really interested, but you see my point. We're, you know, we're not recognizing the talent of entrepreneurship in schools. We're, we're actually probably doing something that's counterproductive to it. So, you know, think about aiming your success not just at the traditional measures, but how you can start to build a case that they're also, you know, being aimed at some of these other things that we're talking about here. And Jason, you've got a on that and then we'll try to get to yeah, real quick, Chris, thank you for the question. It, and this is something I'm dealing with right now. I mean, when we, just this past year, uh, in partnership with USA Fund, set up seven pilot sites across the country, across a wide variety of industry sectors, what we quickly learned is, you know, w while the chamber is really good at organizing business at scale through our federation, uh, what we realized a lot of this is a technology problem. Uh, we started going through this process of doing shared demand planning coming up with a shared language for communicating competency and credentialing requirements, but a shared language that also encourages differentiation, mass customization, and building the talent pipeline. A lot of this is being done through just rudimentary Excel spreadsheets, phone calls, sweat, free survey tools. <coughs> we had to patch together stuff to get the job done, and then we had to transfer it from region to region around the country, and they loved it, and we did it because we saw the value and the companies loved it. But then we sat back after that and just said, man, isn't there an app that could just simplify this? And what we found is there isn't. So we are now starting to explore how we could start developing some minimally viable products around these types of just core activities that we're asking employers to engage in. This is an untapped market. There's nothing out there that does this. And we have um, just these great uh, federation members out there who do this on an annual basis, but would love to do it on a quarterly basis, if not more frequently, if technology could deliver a solution. So that's not necessarily a direct ed tech space, but it is a technology problem, and I would encourage anyone who's interested in exploring that space further to work with us, because I think if this is done right, this is going to be something that companies, chambers, economic development groups are going to want to use as a core service offering for their members. I think you just got an invitation there. Yes, sir. Yes, um, my name is Jason Ma, <coughs> founder, CEO, and uh, chief mentor. 
of 3EQ, I've uh, personally mentored hundreds of high achievers through my life and got the kids into all the top schools you can think about. And uh, I'm also an author of Young Leaders 3.0. Um, on the side, as part of my community service, I write for Forbes. And a number of my articles went viral. One of them was called, uh, When to Say No to Harvard. But uh, that was a creative title by the managing editor of Forbes, not me, right? I said, oh, okay, all right, that's cool. That's cool, I like that. I have a creative question for you guys so after this. And, but the gist of the article was more about, um, you know, the myth, the, the couch rankings, King Kong being used news and reports, and the other rankings, as well as research universities versus liberal arts schools. What's the difference? What are the differences? At the end of the day, the most important person is a student, is really fit and belonging, right? So imagine that this room is full of parents and 16 and 17 year old high school students here, okay? And you got the US News and Reports head guy doing the annual ranking sitting right next to you guys. Okay, how would, what would you say? What would you say to the parents and to the students as your audience? How would you try to diplomatically reposition your indirect competition, if you will? Diplomatically, that has your name all over it, Schneider. <laughs> <laughs> so, in, in, so for full disclosure, I am actually I actually do the Money Magazine ranking, and we are right. We've been complimented for the fact that it's, it's much more uh, outcomes oriented and, uh, and and does all kinds of value added uh, measures. So, my answer to a parent, my answer to a parent is the following. Okay, if your child gets into Harvard or Princeton or any of the, you know, the, the top schools, almost inevitably the answer is go, right? So that, that's because it doesn't matter if you major in poetry in Yale, you're gonna be okay, right? And we have plenty of examples of that. It, after, and, and actually, my, neither of my daughters got into Princeton and I like, really hated them for months, <laughs> years after that. <laughs> You know, I mean, I still like, I, because I took it as a personal affront, you know, I wasn't smart enough to make them smart enough to get into Princeton. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so, but my advice is, is that. The second, you know, like, the top 10 schools are the top 10 schools. Money Magazine, US News, any ranking is gonna take the top 10 schools and put them, and, and put them up there. And, you know, again, it's not a question of value added. You know, all you get is the, the, the ring, the secret handshake, you know, the club, you know, you get all that kind of stuff. After that, it, it, there's a question of fit, there's a question of value added, there's a question of, you know, counseling your kid, like if you, if you want to go into early childhood, you want to go into culinary arts, you know, you're going to be living with me for a long time, <laughs> right? So, I mean, those are the kinds of things that you have to, you, you have to t uh, tell, t counsel your children. Uh, because the fact is that what you study is more important than where you study, except for the, the really top schools. Well, we, uh, I'm just getting the um, you know, hook here, but um, this work uh, is going to continue with our USA Fund's involvement and support over the next few years, and we'll be updating you um, on this work through our website, through conferences, through articles, the Gallup Daily Poll is going to produce weekly monthly annual report so you'll be able to see this work as it develops so we thank you very much for your involvement here today and thank my panel for a very engaging conversation